Okay, good morning. And welcome once again. And, and today, we just want to go straight into the world. The last few weeks, we have been talking about building. Building, letting God build us. And as we declared this year, 2022, as the year of God's rebuilding, today we want to encourage you with the word of God. And basically, basically the title of my message is Come to Christ, the Living Stone. In every building, in every uh, construction that we do, in every rebuilding that we do, the stone, the foundation, the cornerstone is important. So turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 8. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 8. Verse 4 says, To whom coming as unto a living stone, this allowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believed on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which, which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And the stone stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. My friends, this is a picture of the great house that God is building, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in these four verses or five verses we see, there are three pictures painted, three pictures that are being painted. And, and I want to just look at, at, at verse four and expound on it for a while. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. This is what it says. To whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. The first picture that is painted is that Jesus Christ is the living stone. Jesus Christ is the living stone. Now, how can a stone be living? It cannot. This is simply a picture of how God looks at Christ and his followers. God looks at Christ and his followers like a building that is being built by God himself. The foundations of God's building is his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if a person wants to be part of God's building, he has to place his life upon that foundation stone, Christ himself. But I want you to note what this verse says. The verse says that the living stone was rejected by men. When men look at that stone, that stone which is the Christ, that stone was not wanted. That stone, which is Christ, did not fit in with their plans. When man saw that stone, which is Christ, it was useless to them. It was unsuitable for what they were building. When man saw that stone, which is the Christ, it was not worth the price. Man rejected Christ because they wanted to build their life like they wanted. They wanted to do their own thing. Therefore, they cast the stone of God aside. But I want you to note this morning that stone has been chosen of God. It is the very stone that God has chosen to be the foundation stone for life. It is the only stone that can support. It is the only stone that can bear the weight 
of life. The stone chosen, chosen by God is a living stone. What does that mean? God is eternal. Hence, the building of God will last forever and ever. Therefore, the cornerstone laid by God is bound to be eternal. It shall never go to waste. It will never waste away. The cornerstone is living and shall exist forever and ever. The symbolism of the living cornerstone says three significant things to us. Firstly, the living stone is the first stone laid. All other stones are placed after it. It is the preeminent stone in time. And so it is with Christ. He is the first of God's new movement. And when I say this, what do I mean? I mean that Christ is the captain of salvation. All others are crew members who follow him. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10, it says, For it, it became him for whom are all things and by whom all are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Christ is the author of eternal salvation of our faith. All others are readers of the story. Hebrews 5 verse 9. It says, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Christ is the beginning and the ending. All others come after him and are under him. Revelation 1 verse 8, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Christ is the forerunner into the very presence of God. All others enter God's presence after him. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19 to 20. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 19 to 20 which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entered into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Secondly, the cornerstone is the supportive stone. All other stones are placed upon it and held up by the cornerstone. They all, all the other stones rest upon it. It is the preeminent stone in position and power. So it is with Christ. He is the support. He is the power, the foundation of God's new movement. My friends, remember, Christ is the head cornerstone, the only true foundation upon which man can build. All crumble who are not God's new in God's new movement. 1 Corinthians 3.11 tells us that. For other foundations can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Christ is the chief cornerstone upon which all others are fitly formed together. All who wish, wish to be fitly formed together have to be laid upon him. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 to 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 to 22. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom he also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Christ is the living stone upon which all others have to be built if they wish to live and be a part of God's spiritual house. All others have to be built upon him if they wish to live and have their spiritual sacrifice accepted by God. The scripture reference here is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed, 
of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Thirdly, the living stone is the stone to which men must come if they are to be a part of God's building. It is to Christ that we must come. No one can be a part of God's building unless he places himself upon the foundation stone laid by God. God accepts no one who refuses to become a part of his building. And God is just like all builders. He has a foundation upon which all workers must lay the stones of their lives. Let me give you another scripture. We did this last week. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell and great was the fall of it. Let me go on with our main scripture today. 1 Peter chapter 2, let's look at verses 5 to 6. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 to 6. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. This is the second picture. We as believers, we are the living stones. Remember that God is eternal, which means that his building is eternal. The foundation stone laid by him shall never decay or waste away. Christ lives forever and ever. Therefore, when we place our lives upon the living stone of God, the living stone supports and holds us up eternally. We become living stones, stones that shall exist forever and ever. And I want you to note three significant facts concerning this. Firstly, Believers are being built up into a spiritual house. This is a picture of the church that God is building all over the earth. And it includes all believers of all generations. It is a picture of what is called the universal church or the universal temple of God. Note that God's house is a spiritual house. It means that God's house is, a spirit, is, is spiritual as opposed to physical. I want you to note this morning, a physical house is not permanent. It ages and it wastes away. But not God's spiritual house. The spiritual world or dimension is the real world. It is the world that is permanent and eternal. Therefore, the spiritual house of God does not age or decay. And this means two wonderful things. First, when we turn to God and when we lay our lives upon the foundation stone of Christ, we become a part of God's spiritual house. We shall never die and we shall never waste away, but we shall live permanently forever and ever in God's spiritual and eternal house. Secondly, there are many stones who are going to live forever with us. It takes many stones to build a great building. And the same is true of God's spiritual house. We are only one of many who are being placed into God's great spiritual house. The point that I'm trying to make is this. There is no room for pride, arrogance, envy, jealousy, 
criticism, backbiting, anger, accusations, discriminations, prejudice, or wrath among God's building. No room for a stone to become puffed up over another stone. All living stones are needed in God's house. In fact, the house cannot be completed unless there are enough stones to build it. There is a place for all of us. And we are going to exist together forever. Therefore, we are to place ourselves and take our place in the house of God. We are to place ourselves right where we belong and to do our part in holding up the building. We are not to seek the place. We are not to seek the position. We are not to seek the function of any other stone. We are not to weaken the building to any degree. My friends, the point is clear. So long as a brick lies by itself, it is useless. That brick becomes of use when it is built into a building. That is why it was made. And it is, being, it is in being built into a building that the brick realizes its functions and its reasons for its existence. And it is so with the individual Christian. To realize your destiny, you must not remain alone, but you, you must be built into the fabric and edifice of the church. Secondly, believers are a holy priesthood. The chief function of the priest is to stand between God and men, to represent men before God, and to present man to God. Man has just never felt worthy enough to approach God. He has usually felt that God was so far away that he could never reach God. Therefore, man has felt the need for priests to carry his case before God. The point to note is man's thoughts about God. How far away man thinks God is. So far away that man needs a priest, the godly person to represent him before God. But note what scripture tells us this morning. Believers, you and I are being built up as a holy priesthood. Every single believer now stands before God as a priest. He can now approach God on his own. God is not far off and removed from man. Any person who turns to God and lays his life upon the foundation of Christ becomes a part of God's spiritual house. That person is in the very house of God itself. You and I today can talk and share with God whenever we choose. We can worship and praise God. We can cry out for God's help and God's deliverance anytime we wish. As believers, we are now a priest before God. I want you to understand something this morning. The priesthood of the believer is one of the great teachings of scripture. Just imagine we stand before God as a priest. We stand before God as one who has access into God's presence any time of any day. There is no reason whatsoever why we should ever be overcome by any problem or trouble in this life. We are in the house of God. We can approach God anytime. We can receive whatever we need to meet the demands of life. Wisdom, provision, resource, strength. Now I want you to note why we are made priests before God. We are made priests before God that we might offer spiritual sacrifices to God. In the past, men have brought their sacrifices to priests and had the priests present their sacrifices to God. But now, believers ourselves are made priests for this purpose, that we might offer up our own sacrifices to God. Men are now to bring their own offerings, their own sacrifices to God. They themselves are now the priests in the house of God. 
But you need to, to note a critical point. Our sacrifices are made acceptable only by Jesus Christ. A person has to have his life lying upon the foundation of Christ. He must be trusting and believing in the support and power of Christ to make him a part of God's house. The only sacrifices that God accepts are the sacrifices made within his house. Scripture says that the believer is to make the following sacrifices. Firstly, the believer is to sacrifice his body as a living sacrifice to God. He is not to be conformed to this world. Turn with me to Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. We are to sacrifice our body as a living sacrifice to God. We are not to be conformed to this world. Next, we are to sacrifice our life to God as we walk day by day. We are to follow God in love, even as Christ loved us even as Christ gave himself as an offering and sacrifice to God. 1 John 3.16 is your scripture reference. 1 John 3.16 where it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We are to offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Hebrews 13 verse 15. Hebrews 13 verse 15 says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. We are to offer the sacrifices of good works and gifts and money. Romans 12 verse 13. Romans 12 verse 13 says, distributing to the necessity of saints, giving to hospitality. We are to offer spiritual sacrifices, that is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. The scripture reference for that is Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, where it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, Faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. As believers, we are to sacrifice our life in order to lead people to faith in Christ. Matthew chapter 4 verse 19. And he said unto them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Thirdly, I want you to note that we as believers of Jesus Christ, we are are a fulfillment of prophecy. We are a fulfillment of prophecy. The prediction that the Messiah would be, the prediction that the Messiah would be the chief cornerstone of God's building was made centuries before Christ came into the world. There were four things that were, there were four great things that were predicted. The first thing that was predicted was that God himself would lay the chief cornerstone. God himself will send the Messiah into the world. God himself will use him as the foundation of God's eternal house. The second thing that was predicted was that God would select and elect him to be the chief cornerstone. There would be plenty of philosophies, religions, and ideas about how to best build a world and life for men. But God would choose only one foundation stone for the world and life, and that's Jesus Christ. The third thing predicted was that God would count his foundation stone precious. The stone selected by God will be the most precious thing in all the universe. It would be his very own son. He would choose his own son to become the foundation stone for man's life and for the eternal world God was planning. My friends, there is nothing in the world that is any more precious to God and his own dear son. Therefore, God would count him precious. 
the only thing precious enough to serve as the foundation stone for the eternal house of God. And the fourth thing that was predicted was that believers will not be confounded. That means believers will not be put to shame. Believers will not be put, or believers will not be disappointed and confused. Believing and trusting in Jesus Christ, leaning upon him and building upon the Christ is the only way to keep from being eternally confused, shamed, and disappointed. The point I'm trying to make is this, my friends. As believers, our salvation in Christ. As believers, as our, and, our, and our salvation in Christ, these things are the fulfillment of the prophecy. God predicted that he would be building a spiritual and eternal house for believers. God laid the foundation when he sent Christ into the world. And believers have been laying stones of their lives upon Christ ever since. And how are we laying the stones of our lives upon Christ? By believing in him. That means by laying our lives upon him or by building upon him. And the result has been phenomenal. Those who have built upon Christ have experienced a most wonderful thing. All that confusion, all that shame, all that disappointment in this life and the fear of judgment in the next life have disappeared. Believers are now flooded with life. A life that just overflows with love, joy, peace, victory and triumph and with confidence and assurance that all things shall be well in the future. In John chapter 1 verse 12, John chapter 1 verse 12, scripture says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Let's go back to our main scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2, and we are looking at verses 7 to 8. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 to 8. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. The third picture painted is this. Unbelievers are pictured here as disobedient builders. Christ has done so much for men. So Christ should be the most precious thing in a man's life. But the greatest tragedy in all of history is that Christ is not considered to be precious by some people. Christ is precious to us believers. But we are a small minority of people. The vast, vast, the vast, vast majority of people are unbelievers. They just do not believe that Jesus Christ is the foundation stone for their lives. The four points of the scripture state it well. Firstly, unbelievers disqualify the stone. They look at the various foundation stones of life and they do not want that stone, the Christ. They do not think that the stone will fit in with their plans. They do not believe that the stone, the Christ, will suit what they are building. They do not believe the stone, the Christ, is worth the price. They do not think the stone, the Christ, is worth all they are and have. So the point is forceful. They reject, they disqualify the stone. They do not want Christ enough to give all they are and have in order to get him. Secondly, Christ is made the head of the corner anyway. Despite the rejection of men, Christ is made the chief cornerstone of the only permanent and lasting building. God selected and elected him despite men. And if man is to become a part of an eternal house that lasts forever, that brings an abundance of life, man has to lay his life upon the foundation of Christ. Thirdly, 
unbelievers stumble over the stone of Christ. Remember, he is the rock that offends them. When people look at Jesus Christ, they stumble over him. They do not understand. They do not understand how he could be anything other than a man, just like the rest of us. They do not understand how he could be born of a virgin, God incarnate in human flesh. They do not understand how he could live a sinless life, a life without committing a single sin. They do not understand how his death could be any more than the death of a martyr who died for a great cause. They do not understand how his resurrection is, sim is, is anything but a tall tale made up by his followers to secure more and more followers. Simply stated, many people do not understand, many people do not believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. They do not believe that he was sent into the world by God to save men. They do not believe that he was able to live a sinless life because he was God, men who had come to earth for that very purpose, a man who has come to earth for that very purpose. And that Jesus died and arose from the dead as the perfect and ideal man so that his ideal death and resurrection could cover men. People just stumble over the facts or else they are offended by Christ because he lays the burden of total commitment upon men. After all, if Jesus Christ is truly who he claimed to be, we owe him our lives, all that we are and have. And most men are not willing to give up the right to their lives and property. They are even offended at this demand of Christ. Therefore, they stumble over him. But I want you to take note this morning. To stumble means that we have tripped up and fallen, that we damage ourselves. To be offended means that we hurt ourselves. And, 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 and fourthly, what are we stumbling over? We are actually stumbling over the word, the very word of God itself. What is so awful about this? The word of God is the only incorruptible seed on earth that lives and abides forever. If we reject the glorious gospel of God's word, the glorious gospel that Jesus Christ is the foundation stone of God's building, then we are rejecting the only hope of living forever. We are pointing ourselves to a state of unbelief. We are pointing ourselves to a state of disobedience to God. That is, we are steeping ourselves in a more and, and we are steeping ourselves in more and more unbelief and becoming harder and harder to the gospel. We are living lives that are becoming more and more disobedient. In John chapter 3, verse 36. John chapter 3, verse 36. This is what scripture says. He that believeth on the Son and everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abided on him. My friends, in this season of rebuilding, I want to encourage all of you this morning, no matter what you are experiencing in this present journey, whatever the situation is, come to Christ. Come to Christ the living stone. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that we have been called out of the world to become part of your church to join the saints who live in thanksgiving and praise to you. We recognize that we have been called to be an active part of your flock. And we are, we, we, we are called to be active flock, active sons, as we are in a world that counters everything that you have said and done. Father, we don't love the evil that they love, but we have different passions and purposes. And we sense that some of our choices makes us both uncomfortable. But as we choose you, even if it's in discomfort, Lord, it is okay with us. 
We want the world to know you and the peace of your grace and the meaning of life that you have given all of us. We want the world to realize that the confrontation, the confrontations that they feel when they hear your word is the confrontation of love and truth that you bring to every heart. Father, this week, use us to encourage your flock to be an ambassador of grace and peace to a confused and lost world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. To those on social media, we thank you for joining us. We will see you all next week. For those in the household, please hold on for a while.